The Word of God is a sure foundation that has stood the test of time. Sadly, millions have built their religion on the ever-shifting sands of human opinion. Jesus warned only those who anchor their faith on the unchanging rock of His Word will stand through the coming storm. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Here We Stand, Foundations of Our Faith. Good evening, friends. Welcome again to Here We Stand, Foundations of Our Faith. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said to His disciples, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That rock is Jesus. Amen? And it's the words that Jesus preached and spoke. That's what we build our faith upon, the Word of God. I'd like to welcome those of you joining us via satellite across the country and around the world. We want to wish you a happy Sabbath. Right now here in Eastern Time Zone, the Sabbath is just about ready to begin. So we want to wish all of those who are watching as well as the group here, uh, may the Lord richly bless you during these Sabbath hours. There are a few important announcements we'd like to bring to your attention. Tomorrow morning at 10.30 Eastern Time, we'll be doing a live morning Sabbath uh, worship service or presentation by Pastor Doug. So we want to invite all of those here in Lansing. Be sure to be here for that at 10.30. We go live on the air tomorrow morning. Also, those of you watching, you can join us for this special event, 10.30 Eastern Time, so you'll have to adjust it to whichever time zone you might be in. We also want to remind everyone that tomorrow evening there are two very exciting things happening. Our last meeting will be at 7 p.m. tomorrow evening. But before that, beginning at 6 p.m., there will be a musical concert that will also be broadcast live. So be sure to be here for that. Those of you watching, you can join us for that musical program as well. We trust that that will be a rich blessing for all of you and those of you watching that uh, the music will draw you closer to God's presence. Well, we're going to begin with music this evening. So I'm going to invite John Lomacain to come and join us for that. As we sing our theme song once more, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's stand together as we've done from night to night. Those of you watching the program, join us as we raise our voice to the glory of the Lord. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to veil his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil wide. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Amen. Tonight, Dr. David Fernandez, who's an orthopedic surgeon and also one of the elders from the Grand Blank Seventh-day Adventist Church, is going to lead us to the throne of grace and prayer. Remain standing as we kneel together. Our most gracious Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to be here tonight to worship you, to study your word, to allow your Holy Spirit to fill our hearts, and we're thankful that we can do this in freedom here in this evening, here in this location. Lord, we know that you are coming soon, and for that we are happy, but we pray, Father, that it will be quick, that we don't have to stay in this world any longer than we absolutely have to. But Lord, many of us are just satisfied with this, the way that our life is. But Father, help us to step out of our comfort zone. Help us to do what you have us to do here, to go out and to witness to our neighbors, to our friends, to our families, to make the decision that we will do all that we can to advance your word. Father, we don't have much time. We see the signs around us that your coming is imminent, even at the door. And Lord, I pray that not one soul present here today, not one soul that is listening to us on the radio or watching on TV will be lost. I pray that all 
will make a decision to, to give their lives to you. I pray, Father, that you will be with Pastor Bachelor as he brings us the word tonight, that you will speak through him in a mighty way. I pray that you will bless his ministry, that you will bless all of his staff, and Father, each one of us here, when we leave here tonight, may we have a renewed, deep, intense desire to go out and share you with other people. We ask that you fill us with your presence. We ask that you will chase the devil and his angels out of this auditorium, out of the presence of anyone who's listening or watching tonight, that nothing will interfere between communion with you. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Welcome, friends, to Here We Stand. And if you have just joined us, this is a special series of presentations. There'll be over nine days, ten presentations, dealing with some of the distinctive teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church that make us a little bit unique. And it's also an invitation for members of God's Remnant Church to take a stand again to, for a revival in our beliefs. That's why we've used the theme of these rocks. You know, I became a Christian because I lived up in the mountains and I was living under a boulder. Uh, we've called it a cave, but it wasn't like Carl's Bad Caverns. It was back, actually a great big boulder that had uh, an opening underneath it. And I found a Bible there under this massive rock. And so I've always appreciated that symbol that Christ is the rock. And uh, I guess Bible questions now. Time for Bible questions. All right. Let me get on my mark, Pastor oh, Doug. Sorry. There we go. Okay. You all know about that. <laughs> Okay, question number one. What does the Bible say about preparation for baptism? Well, preparation for baptism is, uh, of course, the Bible tells us that you should be taught. Jesus said, teach all nations. They should believe those teachings, accept and believe them. And it's one thing to believe with your mind, but there should be a willingness to follow the things that you are assenting to. There should be a love in the heart. Uh, Philip said to the Ethiopian treasurer, he said, if you believe with all your heart, there must be a faith. And uh, uh, the Bible tells us, John the Baptist, when he invited people to be baptized, he said, you should bring forth fruits meet for repentance. In other words, there ought to be a change in the life because baptism represents a new birth. In other words, you don't get baptized so that you can get the power to uh, give up your addictions. Christ gives you that power before baptism to fall in love with him, to live a new life, and then you're baptized. And so, uh, and of course, you should be old enough to understand those uh, commitments and the fundamentals I just talked about. And repent of your sins, turning away from sin. Okay, here's the next question. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 2, the Bible speaks of the bride of Christ as being the new Jerusalem. The other night, you mentioned that the bride of Christ represents the church. There's really no conflict there because the New Jerusalem is the city with all the mansions that Jesus has prepared. Who's living there? It's a church. And so they're really synonymous. When it refers to the New Jerusalem, uh, Jesus is not in love with, you know, the, the metal and the minerals that the city is made of. It's who's going to live there, his bride. Okay, what separates the Bible from other holy books? Well, a lot of things. We could probably take quite a bit of time talking about that. The Bible is miraculous in its origin. Yeah, holy men and women spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. It's miraculous in the way it has been preserved, even though there have been a number of events through history. And it's been miraculous in the way that its content, the consistency of its content. Uh, I've been to Israel and looked at the Dead Sea Scrolls in the museum there with a guide that could read Hebrew. And he quoted, our guide was very highly trained, and he could even read the archaic ancient Hebrew characters. And he, I picked a passage out of the Isaiah scroll, 2,000-year-old document we're looking at. And he began to read to me. Of course, they read backwards from what we read in English. And uh, it was exactly like, and he was translating for me. And it was exactly like the translation. It was the story of Sennacherib and Hezekiah is what he picked. And I just got chills to think how God has preserved it. But for me, what convinced me about the authenticity of the Bible is the incredible accuracy of the prophecies. Um, for instance, you know, Jesus said 
in about 30 A.D. There'll not be left one stone upon another in the temple. This generation will not pass away. A generation in Bible times is 40 years. 40 years later, 70 A.D., the temple was destroyed and they did not leave one stone upon another because when they burned it, the gold melted down into the cracks and they didn't want to miss any of the gold. And I could just go through the, the prophecies of Daniel. We don't have time for it all, but the accuracy and the durability of the prophecies for me is the most compelling. What are your thoughts? I was going to say the same thing. The prophecies of the Bible. And not only prophecies that were fulfilled in the time of Jesus, but even prophecies that we see being fulfilled today. Yeah. Oh. It's a book for today. Yeah, you want to, pardon me, I, I get excited about this. For me, one of the most compelling signs of the end, it said that uh, knowledge would increase. There's no generation in the world like our generation. My grandfather lived when they used kerosene lamp and horses. Look at how much we've changed in one generation. And the Bible says the gospel would go to all the... Well, I'm getting... We've got a presentation tomorrow night. Come back, we'll talk about that. All right. Here's the next one. Was the law of paying tithe nailed to the cross? Well, one of the simple clues you have about the laws that um, uh, are nailed to the cross, most of those are contained in the ceremonial laws connected with the Exodus experience. Now, for instance, there's laws about clean and unclean. Well, that goes back to Noah. Uh, Abraham paid tithe. Jacob paid tithe. Uh, they predate uh, Moses. Um, and the purpose for tithe, obviously, when Jesus died on the cross, the, the fundamental purpose of tithe was it was an opportunity for people to show their faith in God by returning a percentage of their income for the purpose of the spreading of the gospel and the sustenance of ministry. That need did not change. If anything, it increased in the New Testament. I've actually met people who think that New Testament Christians don't have to pay tithe. Well, if you're going to go by the New Testament, it's a lot more than tithe. They say, uh, no man says that aught that he had was his own, Acts chapter 2, but all men had everything in common. And they brought their houses and lands and sold them, and they laid the money at the apostles' feet. You all ready to go liquidate your houses and lands? Uh, so tithe is the, it's kindergarten in giving for the Christian. By the way, Jesus says in Matthew 23, 23, you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and you've omitted the weightier matters of the law, like justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done, not leave the other undone. Meaning, don't neglect the basics of tithe, but don't forget the priority. Now, Christ still said tithe's intact. Last night you spoke about Ellen White. Here's a question. I have read on the internet that Ellen White was a false prophet. What do you think of this? Well, if Ellen White is a true prophet, I'd be amazed if you went on the internet and didn't read that she was a false prophet. Because if you were the devil, just suppose, you'd obviously want to do your job well, right? You'd want to be a good devil. Let's all raise our hands, right? <laughs> That's not a good question. But um, if you were the devil, and God did have a more modern example of the gift of prophecy with these important messages for his people, how would you want to market that person? What, how would you smear? How would you slander that person? What did the contemporaries of Jesus say about Jesus? They said, you have a devil and you are a Samaritan. You cast out devils by the prince of devils. You work for Be Beelzebub. I mean, Jesus and the apostles were constantly slandered. Jesus said, look, if they've hated me, they're going to hate you. So what, what would you expect? Of course you're going to find that kind of stuff on the internet. Okay, here's another question. Where in the Bible do you find that Moses is in heaven? Well, you, you read uh, two things. One, in the book of Jude, verse 9, it says, Michael the archangel, when disputing with the devil over the body of Moses. It doesn't say he was resurrected, but we're assuming the reason they're disputing over the body is because that a resurrection was going to take place. Jewish tradition does tell us Moses was raised three days later. But then you go to Mark chapter 9, and it says that Christ walked up the Mount of Transfiguration and he was glorified and Moses and Elijah appeared to him and communed with him there. If you read the same story in, I believe it's Luke chapter 9, it says they talked about his decease he was going to accomplish in Jerusalem. It even tells what they talked about. So that gives us a lot of reason if Moses is talking to Jesus along with Elijah who we know went to heaven, we believe that Jude is accurate that Michael did resurrect Moses. Okay, here's a question on Bible prophecy. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 10, it says, He shall have tribulation ten days. 
does this refer to an event in the future, or is it something that already happened? Okay, um, in, when it's talking about the church of Smyrna having tribulation 10 days, we've learned in prophecy a day equals a year, correct? Uh, this was a prophecy of the second age of the church, the age of the church of Smyrna. The most severe persecution was under the Roman emperor, I often say this wrong, Diocletian. And that was 303 to 313 A.D., 10 years. And the church of Smyrna, myrrh means fragrance or incense. Their lives were like offered up as a sacrifice or an incense uh, for the Lord. And it was uh, literally 10 years of severe persecution. He tried to eradicate the Christian religion. Okay. The other night you mentioned or you read a verse that spoke about they shall be least in the kingdom of heaven. What does this mean? Well, it's not saying, well, let me read the whole verse so we have the context here. Whosoever shall break one of the least of these commandments and teach men also, he will be spoken of or he will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. It does not mean that person is in the kingdom. What Jesus is saying, when you get the original Greek, those in the kingdom of heaven speak of that person as least or the lowest. In the wording there, they had the lowest and the highest. The lowest kind of individual, the greatest kind of individual. In the kingdom of heaven, those who break God's commandments and teach others to break God's commandments are spoken of as the lowest kind of individual. They're not there. You got that? It's not talking about them being there. Okay. Well, I think that's it for uh, questions Question tonight. Time's up. Friends, tonight we're going to do something a little different. We're very thankful that we have a special message right now from the new president of 3ABN, a dear friend of ours, Elder Jim Gilley. Hi, it's a real privilege for 3ABN to join with Amazing Facts in bringing you the special series, Here We Stand. We look forward to more projects like this where we're working together, cooperating together in order to bring the gospel to a dying world. We know that this good news is exciting as people are listening, as you are viewing, and as you are seeing what God is doing and the truths that He's revealing in these last days. We need you to stand with us in a very special way at this particular time to give in order that we might continue to be able to put programs like this on the air. It is very expensive. There's no question about that to go out in the field and to shoot live and to bring it up to the satellite and to put it into your home. And so we trust that you will stand with us and with amazing facts in bringing this about. Any of these offerings that are given will be divided between these two organizations so that we might be able to continue to work together to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to a dying world. Doug, we appreciate all that you're doing. You and I have been friends for many, many years, and I look forward to continuing to have a great relationship with these two organizations. May God continue to bless you in this series. Amen. And I want to thank Elder Gilly. Uh, Brother Jim Gilly and myself have been friends. I know he's got a, a passion. He's an evangelist at heart, and he has a passion for souls. And that is probably the right time to lead into our offering. You know, one of the ways that you can give, of course, there's a local offering received here, but you can also give by simply going to the websites of 3ABN or Amazing Facts, and there's a place where you can support what we're doing right there. And I got an email today I was very excited about. Uh, we have been uh, using a website format for about almost six years, five and a half years at Amazing Facts. As of, I think, yesterday, our new website is up and running. It's very, very exciting. And so when you get a chance, we do hope you'll check it out. I was very happy to, to uh, we looked at it together. Today, it was didn't great. We? Very exciting. I'll let you finish calling for the offer. <laughs> okay. Thank you, friends. Again, friends, we appreciate everything you're doing to help make these... Um, here We Stand Revival Series uh, be shown not only here but around the world. At this time, while the offering is taken, we're going to ask for um, John Lowell McCain to come and lead us in a beautiful song. Uh, and we ask that the Lord will richly bless you as you give to this wonderful cause. You know, friends, as I thought about the subject tonight, this song is about identity. You know, the real question is, when the Lord comes, will we know Him? Not will we know of him, 
Not will we know his teachings. Not will we be a member of his church. But will we know him? And this, ta this song tonight is going to ask you the question of how intimate a walk you have with Jesus Christ. I pray that as you listen to the message, you can be confidently assured that if Jesus were to come to this meeting tonight, there would be no doubt that you would know him. Would I know you now If you walked into the room If you stilled the crowd If you light dispel the gloom If I saw your wounds Touch your thorn pierced brow I wonder if I'd know you now Listen. Would I know you now If you walked into this place Would I cause you shame Would my games be your disgrace Would I worship Fall upon my face I wonder if I'd know you now Or have the images I painted So distorted who you are That even if the world were looking They could not see you the real you have i changed the true reflection to fulfill my own desires making you what i want not showing you for divine oh divine would i miss you if you left and closed the door And would my flesh cry out I don't need you anymore Would I follow you And could I be restored Lord Lord, I wonder if I'd ever learn I wonder if I'd know This is eternal life, that you might know Him, know Jesus Christ. Welcome once again, friends, to Here We Stand. It is my privilege to talk with you about some of the fundamental Bible teachings that sometimes you don't hear. There are a number of areas where the Christian church has sort of been diluted with the world in which we live, and that's not God's plan. Uh, I'd like to begin with an amazing fact, as I sometimes do. Perhaps you've heard of a doctor by the name of Joseph Lister. Uh, he was not very popular for a good part of his life, but maybe you need to better understand why. Today, when you think of hospitals, you think that they are uh, fortresses of sterile environment, whether you've got the latex gloves and the face masks and the sanitary gowns and the air purifying systems. But it wasn't always that way. Matter of fact, if you go back 150 years, uh, hospitals were pretty filthy places. In fact, roughly 50% of patients of major surgery died. 
And it wasn't necessarily because of the surgery. Matter of fact, you've heard the expression before, the surgery was a success, but the patient died. Well, that's the time it was coined. Because doctors would go sometimes from patient to patient wearing bloody aprons, using their bare hands with dirty instruments they had just used on another patient. In some cases, they would actually go from dissecting a cadaver and then use the same instruments on a living patient. I know you and I can't comprehend that kind of lack of sanitation, but that was very common, even through Europe, some of these very sophisticated, supposedly sophisticated countries. But a young physician by the name of Joseph Lister, he said, you know, reading the Bible, and in the Bible, he was a dedicated Christian. It said, whenever you came in contact with something unclean or the dead, you were to wash thoroughly. And then he became a friend of Louis Pasteur and his findings. He said, the reason we're losing so many people is because of sanitation. They discovered 80% more people who gave birth in the hospital lost their children than those who had their babies at home because of the doctors. They didn't know what they were doing as far as spreading of disease. Eventually, Lister set up a hospital in Glasgow. A lot of ridicule and persecution just about drove the poor man crazy. And uh, they noticed that in his hospital, the uh, deaths due to infection were cut by 80 to 90 percent. And they had been so common. And gradually, it began to take ground. He was accepted. He was knighted after years of fighting uphill persecution just for simple sanitary procedures. Medicine now even dates itself by the before and after Lister age. And you've probably gathered at this point that uh, that's where you get what you find in your medicine cabinet called Listerine. It did not begin in the restroom. It began in the operating room. It was an antiseptic. And Band-Aids, too. Finally, he was knighted and respected. Louis Pasteur said Joseph Lister may have been the most important man in modern time when it came to medicine. Just teaching the simple practices of purity, cleanliness, and sanitation greatly reduced the deaths. They had said if he had made his discoveries 10 years earlier, one-third of the deaths from the Civil War could have been prevented. Most of them died from gangrene, simple cuts and, and wounds, and the infection that set in. Purity. A lot of people still die from a lack of purity. The Bible tells us that God has called us to purity, and our message tonight is dealing with the subject, power in purity. Now, this is again one of those cases where I have so much to say. You pray for me, and I'm going to try to talk quickly and yet clearly because there's a lot of material I'd like to cover. First of all, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. I want to live in the presence of God someday, don't you, friends? Jesus said, blessed, happy are the pure in heart, for they will see God, see him face to face. And again, speaking of the 144,000, it says, these are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. Might I submit to you that if we want to follow the lamb there in heaven, then we must first follow the Lamb here now. A Christian is not just a new label that we acquire when we get baptized. A Christian is a follower of Christ. That means we follow his example. We follow his teaching. We want to be like him. And Jesus was pure. Jesus was sinless. And the goal for every Christian is a goal of holiness. What I'm sharing with you is not some new theology. It's not some unrealistic ideal. God will never ask you to do anything that you cannot do with his help. All things are possible through Christ. Jesus did not come to save us in our sins. The angel told Mary, they will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. If Christ is living out his life in you, all things are possible. And God is calling us to lives of holiness. And yet I have seen, I'm sure you have, that worldliness is diluting the potency of the Christian message. God is calling us to a purity of life that is becoming more the exception than the rule. Now, why do we want to live this new life? It's got to be because we love him. Question number one. 
What was Jesus' attitude towards the people of the earth? How does Jesus feel about the people in the world? You all know John 3, 16. I can't improve on it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. God so loves the world. Number two, why should we love Jesus? Why do we love Jesus? Do we love him because he says, look here, you don't love me, I'm going to throw you in hell. So shape up. Can you love anybody on those terms? The Bible tells us in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. And where do we best see his love for us demonstrated? Isn't it at the cross? It's where we see his great love for us. It melts and breaks our hearts and it, we feel this natural reciprocal desire to love him in return. Romans 5, 8, while we were yet sinners, Jesus died for us. He loves us even in our unlovable condition. Now, you and I find it easier to love some people than others, right? And uh, some people are very difficult to love. Matter of fact, I've got this theory. One reason the Lord wants everybody to go to church is so we can learn to love. Because there are some people in every church that God places there, just they're sort of the exercise equipment <laughs> for us to learn to develop our love muscles. And if everybody in your church was lovable, you'd never learn anything. But we've got to learn to love. Now, loving God's a little easier. But the Lord says, look, if you want to love me who you can't see, you learn that by loving your brother who you can see. I'm paraphrasing. And so whenever you meet somebody that's challenging your love muscles, just say, thank you, Lord. Help me be like Jesus. Help me love them the way you do. It doesn't come naturally. One thing that helps you love somebody more if I hand you a book, and, you know, a lot of books get printed these days, you might say, thanks very much. Can I keep it? I'll say, yes, you can keep it. Thank you very much. You might take it home. You might not even read it. But as you're leaving, if I said, now that book costs $50,000, it's the only one left in the world, are you more inclined to take care of it and maybe even read it? Why? Because you realize how much it's worth. Don't forget how much Jesus paid for you. The highest price that could be paid for anybody was the price of God's own son. What can you give more than the creator of all things? And so when God gave his son, he paid the highest price that can be paid. And that's the price paid for everybody. And so he wants us to love people, because he does. Number three, what is the best motive for obeying God? Why do we obey Jesus? John chapter 14, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, do what? Talk about my commandments? Preach about my commandments? Keep them. They're holy. He wants us to keep them. By the way, there's one commandment that says, remember the Sabbath day to keep. The very fact that Jesus uses the word keep there ought to tell you something, right? Keep it holy. Galatians 5, 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. What is it that motivates us to work? Faith working through love. Are there good works in the Christian religion? Sure. The Bible talks a lot about works. The issue is not that works are bad. Works are good. Works are important. We're not saved by works, but the works should be there. If the works aren't there, Jesus said, you know them by their fruit. It, it might, they might say they're, you know, a, a blueberry, but uh, if they don't have the fruit, if it's just thistles, then they're lying. You'll know them by their fruits. And so if a person says, I'm a Christian, and they don't have Christ-like actions and attitudes in their life, well, then it's false advertising. We really are supposed to be like Christ. That's the goal. That's what we teach. That's how we should encourage everybody. That's not legalism. We do it because we're doing it out of love for him. Number four, why does Jesus say, I'm sorry, what does Jesus say are the results of obeying him? John chapter 15, verse 11. These things I've spoken unto you so you could all be miserable. Why does Jesus share truth with us? These things I've spoken to you that you might 
my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. My cup runs over. He wants Christians to be full of joy. He wants us to have abundant life. Some people have the idea that the, the requirements of Christianity are there to take away our happiness. In reality, the only true lasting peace and happiness is the peace and happiness that comes from knowing your sins are washed away and that you've got eternal life. Everything else is just a drug. It's temporary. It's an illusion. The real joy that bubbles over, the real abundant happiness comes from knowing my sins are forgiven and I have eternal life. Uh, nothing can pass that up. Sickness can't take that away. Financial reverses cannot take that away. Persecution from others cannot take that away. It's a peace that passes understanding. John chapter 13 verse 17. Jesus said, if you know these things, happy are ye if you what? Do them. Does the Lord want us to be hearers of his word or doers? Christians ought to be doing different things than everybody else. Number five. Why does Jesus give us specific principles for Christian living? Again, is it to take away our happiness? Deuteronomy 6 verse 24. And the Lord commanded us to observe all of these statutes for our good always that he might preserve us alive. Why does any loving parent teach their children about traffic and crossing the street and red, green, and yellow lights, about electric outlets and sharp things, about chemicals underneath the sink? Why do parents teach them those things? To restrict their freedom or to keep them alive? because you love them and statistically the children that are more inclined to listen to those parents rules have a higher chance of survival <laughs> and that is also true of God's children if we are willing to cooperate with God's rules you got a better chance of making it now should a child obey its parents if they don't always understand all the rationale behind the rules yes I mean, sometimes you can't explain to little children all of the dynamics of electric, electricity and the electrons and neutrons and how that all works. You just say, you do not stick the fork in the outlet. <laughs> right? You just take my word for it. And if they say, but why? Because I said so. And I'm bigger than you are. <laughs> that's what I say. <laughs> uh, sometimes that's all you have to resort to. But, I mean, you're doing it because you love them. So you can't always explain it. In other words, should we obey God's word even if we don't always understand why he's asking us to do what he's asking? Yeah. As you mature in Christianity, he will reveal things. And by the way, I found out that as you walk in the light that God has given you, he gives you more light. And sometimes it's not until you take the steps of obedience that you have that aha experience and understand why he was telling you to do what he wants you to do. He wants to say, do you trust me? If we'll step out and obey what he's asking us to do, then we start to get the blessing, then the fog lifts, and the reasons often come later. But whether you understand it or not, we should obey God. Whenever you're in doubt about what to do, do the safe thing. The safe thing is do what he says. Number six, how should Christians relate to the evil of the world and worldliness? Number of verses we could look at. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And it goes on to say, For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father in the world, but it's of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God he will abide forever. Now some people think that there's a conflict here because it says, for God so loved the world, and then he's telling us not to love the world. What is it? Well, when the Lord talks about the world, there's a couple of ways the world is used. In one sense, he's talking about God so loves the world, the people in the world, everybody on the planet, that he gave his life for those people in this world. But when you and I are in the world, he's referring to worldliness because Generally speaking, even Christ called Satan the prince of this world. Satan kind of kidnapped this planet when the original 
stewards, Adam and Eve, surrendered dominion by not trusting God. The devil set up headquarters here and claimed it as his own. And so we are not to love the worldliness of the world. We are really citizens of another kingdom, aren't we? And so as ambassadors of another kingdom, we should represent the kingdom of Christ differently. But we've got a dilemma. We are in a world that operates under the government of selfishness, but we are citizens of a kingdom that operates under the government and the constitution of love. The primary motive of everything the devil does and those who follow him is selfishness. The primary motive of what Christ does and those who follow him is love. You've got this big divergence, big dichotomy of motives. Yet we're in this world and everything about the world, it's all coming, it springs from the wrong motive. And so everywhere you turn as a Christian, you're going to be frustrated because the premise of so much of what happens in the world is sinful and it's springing from the wrong motives. And you need to be aware of that. So how can you live in this world and love people and not love the world? James 4 verse 4, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't love the lost people of the world, but we should not be a friend of worldliness. Amen? Again, 2 Corinthians 6 verse 17. Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the anything that is unclean, and I will receive you. Now, when God is calling us to come out and be separate, I heard a pastor describe it this way one time. A Christian is something like a ship out in the ocean. It is sort of normal for a ship to be out in the ocean. But you don't want the ocean in the ship. If the ocean gets in the ship, then you have a crisis. Christians should get out in the world. Sometimes Christians just sequester themselves in their churches and they don't know how to reach the people in the world. And they sort of isolate themselves like the children of Israel did and say, uh, you know, we're the chosen frozen and they're all lost. And uh, we forget that God sent us to reach the lost. Go into all the world preaching the gospel. But you don't want the world in the church or it sinks. You don't want the world in your heart and in your life or you sink. And when you take your eyes off Jesus, like Peter walking on the Sea of Galilee, you'll sink. If you want to do the miraculous, you've got to keep your eyes on Jesus. Might I offer to you that living a holy Christian life is impossible without a miracle. It's just as possible as it is for you to walk on water. The only way you can do that is to keep your eyes on Jesus. The calling of Christ to his people is the highest calling in the world. It is not just one of many. You think it's tough to be a Marine or to uh, some of the, or be a Navy SEAL or some of the training. The toughest training in the world is to be a real biblical Christian. It is the highest calling in the world. It is nearly impossible unless you keep your eyes on Jesus. Because when Peter kept his eyes on Jesus, he could walk on water. You take your eyes off Jesus, you'll sink and the world will get in and you drown. So you've got that balance. We're surrounded by this sea of evil. For us to be holy in this sea of evil, you know, I understand that there is a, um, a spider that lives in different parts of the world. They have some in Europe, North America. And it lives underwater. But it, it's not a fish. It breathes air. What it does, it makes, it even builds its web underwater. It reproduces underwater. It hunts underwater but it makes regular trips to the surface and it captures bubbles and brings it down to its nest. It makes its nest in a bubble down below. And the only way you can, and I can survive as Christians in this hostile environment of evil is we've got to make regular trips for fresh air and bring it back down. You've got to be praying always in order to, the spider's got to keep doing that to refresh the air in his bubble. And you and I have to do it if we're going to survive down here. Got to constantly surface and pray in that atmosphere of heaven. Romans 12, verse 2. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
What conversion really is, is God gives you a brain transplant. The mind of Christ becomes your mind. As you keep your eyes fixed on him and you hang around with him, you start to become like him. And your mind is renewed. The Holy Spirit comes in and begins to guide and direct your thinking and helps to su suppress the natural tendencies of evil that we have. And you begin to do things you never knew you could do through the power of the Spirit. For me, it may seem strange to you, but for me, one of the most dramatic examples of the power of the Spirit was when I accepted Christ and I became convicted that my, my foul mouth was inappropriate. And I came to Jesus, and I still had bad language when I first accepted Jesus. I mean, I won't go into it, but I knew all the words and knew how to use them. And I did frequently in mixed company. I mean, it was really bad. My grandmother cursed. I mean, what do you expect? When a kid grows up like that, my mother, my father, my I just grew up with it in the home. And uh, after becoming a Christian, I thought, wow, this is kind of strange for me because it's just such a natural part of my vocabulary, but I know it's just not right. And I said, Lord, you're going to have to help me with this. And the amazing thing was after I prayed for help, a miracle occurred. Every time while I was talking, even with my old friends, and I found one of those words was getting ready to come out, it was like this emergency brake would just lock up my jaw. And my brain would all of a sudden go, and go, Boop, not that word, not that word. And it was just doing a delete as I talked. <laughs> delete, 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 delete. <laughs> that was just one sentence. <laughs> now, I still know all those words. But by the grace of the Lord, I don't say them anymore. That's a miracle. And so I, I really don't have a lot of patience for those who are in the church that say, oh, you know, don't take yourself too seriously. I mean, we're in the world, and Jesus loves us the way we are. Well, he does love us, but he's not accepting you the way you are. He loves you right now, but he wants you to change. And the same way he can give me victory over cursing or stealing or drugs or any of those things, he can give us victory over everything. And we make too many excuses for the devil and for sin. We need to raise the standard higher, friends. Amen? James 4, verse 7. How do we do it? Therefore, submit to God... Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You cannot resist the devil until you submit yourself to God. If you humble yourself before God, repent of your sins, say, Lord, I can't do anything. Lord, save me. He can move into your life and then he can do for you the miraculous and helping you live a new life. But all things come by faith. You must believe. And you say, oh, but Pastor Doug, I want to believe, but I've fallen so many times. Don't get discouraged. Get back up. How many times do you think the apostles fell, made mistakes? I like, I always talk about the smoking issue because I struggled with smoking. That was one of the big addictions for me. And uh, you know how many times I quit smoking before I quit smoking? It's like Mark Twain said, quitting's easy. I've done it a hundred times. And so, but you know what? Last time I quit was nearly 30 years ago. Haven't even had a cigarette in my mouth, not one since then. So what the Lord did for me with cigarettes, I just tried to take that as exhibit A and I superimpose that on the other areas of my life. I believe that he can give me victory. You've got to believe it. If you fall, don't say, oh, I guess it didn't work and give up. Get back up again. Say, Lord, help me. He will. Submit yourself to God. Romans 6 verse 2. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We must be dead to sin. You know, dead people don't sin. So if you're crucified with Christ, Paul said, I die daily. You know what that means? Paul, that holy apostle Paul, who said, I fought a good fight, I'm going to be in the kingdom. He knew he had eternal life. He said, I must die daily because I've got this old nature that's constantly clamoring for the throne. And he said, just don't let sin reign over you. Don't let it have dominion over you. And so people whose lives are still controlled by life of sin and the habits and patterns of selfishness, you're not converted. You need to humble yourself, submit to God, and pray. And don't quit praying until you know that God has changed your heart. Sometimes we're too shallow about the way that we repent. I'm not even getting to my subject tonight, but I feel impressed right now. I need to talk about this. Repentance is to be thorough. It's to be deep. You know, if you break a person's heart and you take somebody's life and you just say, oh, sorry, that's not appropriate. 
If I'm walking to the back door of the auditorium and I step on your toe on the way out, I'd probably say, excuse me, and you'd be satisfied, right? But if in my haste to, to go out, I knock you over and break your bones, if I said, pardon me, that's, that's not appropriate. I should at least stop and help you up, right? It, the, the, the bigger the offense, the more you invest. What did God do to provide forgiveness for you and me? You consider the sufferings of Jesus and his agony and the death and the sacrifice and how it ruptured the heart of God Almighty. And churches are now teaching repentance like we've got this little prayer we want you to say. You come up front, you repeat this little prayer. And you know, God meets us where we're at. A lot of people have been saved because of these simple prayers. But don't stop there. Then tell them to go home and tell them how to really repent. Make a list of your sins. That's right. Be specific. Plow up the fallow ground. Say, Lord, I've done a lot of things. Confess your sins. The Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To the same extent you want cleansing, to that extent you ought to confess and repent. And we're so shallow these days. We've got, you know, everybody wants fast food in our culture. We, we got drive through church and drive through everything. People want drive through salvation. That's right. We just say, come on, come on, I got to, well, you tell, give it to me quick. How can I do this? It isn't quick. You got to humble yourself, submit yourself before God, repent of your sins. I mean, you read in the Bible where it talks about them weeping and fasting, rending their hearts and their garments and pleading before God. The people of Nineveh, when God spared them, they did not eat or drink for three days, not even drinking. And God forgave them. Paul, when he realized what he had done to Jesus, Jesus said, I'm the one you're persecuting. Three days he did not eat, he did not drink, he fasted, he wept. David, when he sinned with Bathsheba, laid on his face for seven days. And the modern concept of repentance is, say this two-sentence prayer. And that's all it takes. I think we've really fallen a long way from the biblical teaching of repentance. And the reason we don't see more victory and holiness in the church is because we've tried to, we've tried to take the, the gospel message and turn it into fast food. Number seven, why do we need to guard our thoughts as Christians? Think about what you think about. Romans, I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You are the sum total of what you think. It's, Jesus said, if you believe, all things are possible if you believe, and you do that with your thinking. God wants to convert our hearts. Again, Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart for, with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We've got to guard what comes into our minds through the medium of our eyes and our ears and our mouth. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 5, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Being a Christian means being pure of heart. And being pure of heart means pure of thought. Oh, but Pastor Doug, I can't control what I think, and the devil sends these temptations. Well, not every temptation is necessarily a sin. The devil's going to always try and put crazy things and things you wouldn't want anyone to know about in your mind. I've flown a lot, and sometimes on uh, these overseas planes, they've actually got TV screens on the back of every seat. And I remember one time standing up as I was stretching my legs and I looked over the, the whole fuselage of this plane. It was like a big old jumbo jet. And at night, everyone was sleeping. I could see all these screens lit up. Every seat had a little screen. All these people watching, they had multiple channels they could pick from. And I thought to myself, I wonder what you'd see if everybody had a little LDC monitor on their forehead and all their thoughts were being broadcast all the time. <laughs> Makes you shudder, doesn't it? Does the Lord know what we're thinking? Amen. You need to pray sometimes. And you know what? I'm ashamed. Sometimes I'm on my knees, I'm praying. And these thoughts come into my mind. I say, oh Lord, and I'm on my knees praying. <laughs> my mind is wandering to things I shouldn't think of when I'm standing up. Well, the devil, you know what I'm talking about. The, the devil puts these things in our minds. We've got to learn to discipline our thinking to reject that. And say, Lord, help me. And to seek after the Holy Spirit. He will. He'll change your thinking. Philippians 4.8. What should a Christian think about? 
Whatsoever things are true, so much fiction and fantasy out there, whatsoever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, talking about purity, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think about these things. I see that butterfly on the screen, and I just remembered I was up riding in the hills the other day, and I went through this flock of, of butterflies. Every now and then as I was riding around on the AT feed, this little flock of blue, beautiful blue butterflies would, would take off, and I thought, boy, they're beautiful. And I later noticed that day that there were cow pies on the road. And whenever I drove by cow pie, the butterflies took off. They were feeding on cow pies. And I thought, boy, they're pretty, but they got disgusting habits. <laughs> and it made me think there's a lot of Christians like that. You know, they come to church, they sing about Jesus, and they look like little butterflies on the outside, but they're feeding on manure at home. You know what I'm talking about. Number eight. What are some specific principles for a holy Christian living? Okay, we're going to start getting close to home. You still here? You want me to keep going? He that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Let's talk a little bit about money and greed. You know, one of the commandments, we talked about the Sabbath, but one of them talks about covetousness. In many ways, our culture is nearly bankrupt, and it's because everybody's suing everybody for just about anything. And people are greedy. Everybody's wanting to get rich quick. And everybody is selling, you know, the people who are making the most money are the ones who are selling the seminars on how you can make money. And there's just this, this base love of money. And I don't remember what state it started in, but some state realized they found a windfall by selling lottery tickets. And it sort of became nationalized gambling now. And I meet Christians all the time that are buying lottery tickets. Don't you know that's gambling? Oh, come on. You're probably all buying them. You won't give me an amen on that. Well, let me tell you, I've never bought a lottery ticket. I've actually met Christians that would say, but Pastor Doug, if I win, I'm going to give my tithe. And Don't go there. By the way, did you know your chances of winning? You got a better chance of getting bitten by a shark on dry land. I'm talking about winning big. The reason that somebody's getting all that money is because they're taking your money. You lose. If you want to make money, take what you can spend on lotto tickets and put it in the bank and leave it there. First Timothy, or, or invest it in the kingdom of heaven. There's a better idea. Then you'll, you see, moth and rust will not corrupt. 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. Money's not evil, but the love of money, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Many people in their striving after being rich have lost everything. They get involved in all kinds of schemes and multi-level marketing things so that... I uh, better be careful what I say. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. This we commend to you, that if any would not work, neither shall he eat. If you want to prosper, work. Be productive. Everybody should do something. There are really two kinds of people. You've got producers and consumers. God calls all of his people to be industrious. And I realize if you've got some you know, physical handicap that you might have to be creative in what you can do to produce, but everybody who's a Christian ought to have a productive life and not just a life that's taking, but it's a life that's giving. I remember my father one time gave me a hard time because I was a Christian. My father's not a Christian. He's a great philanthropist. He's given millions of dollars away to, to uh, schools and to hospitals and different things. And, and one time I was speaking positively about... Uh, my church, and he said, I don't believe in religion. I said, Dad, you're giving to schools and hospitals and these humanitarian things all the time. I said, who do you think's building them? You ever seen the first atheist hospital on the this front? <laughs> Sisters of atheism? They don't build hospitals. <laughs> Proverbs 40, verse 3. Christians had a productive life. going out and, and serving the, the uh, community. Another area where there should be holiness, we should be productive in our music. 
Psalms 40 verse 3, he has put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God. The songs that we sing, the music that we listen to, ought to be praising God. Now wait a second, Pastor Doug, I can understand that once a week on church, but you telling me all week long? My music ought to glorify God? Why does it suddenly be okay to listen to ungodly music once you leave the church or worldly music? Now granted, there may be some folk or patriotic songs that are in and of themselves. There may be some things like that that are innocent. I don't want to sound too fanatical. But um, I do want to sound a little fanatical because you need it right now. You know, the pendulum has swung so far the other way that I need to be a little fanatical just to bring you back to center. People are, are listening to all kinds of terrible stuff. The Bible says that the music that we listen to, Ephesians 5, 19, speaking to one another, talking about in our weekly communication, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody. What kind of melodies? Spiritual melodies. Would that be safe to deduce from this verse? In your heart to the Lord. It does make a difference what kind of music we listen to. Music is a very powerful medium. The people who make these commercials, they spend millions of dollars picking the music to go with the commercial. You know, when you walk up and down the aisles of even a Walmart, you know how much money these stores have spent on the exact kind of music they're playing that it'll have the right kind of psychological effect so that you'll feel carefree about spending? Oh, I realize I'm 60000 in debt, but for some reason I feel good today and I'm just going <laughs> to... Spend that credit card one more time and you don't realize that music has a part to play. And you're surrounded with it. You know, I, I go into a store and I've, I've not always been a Christian. I know those old songs and I'll be in the store and I'll hop back in the car and all of a sudden I'm going, Yesterday love was love. Karen goes, Doug. I go, oh, sorry dear. <laughs> he's able, he's able. <laughs> Because you overcome evil with good, right? <laughs> but you're all, you get these things in your head and then they stick there. Because some of them are, you know, they're kind of hypnotic tunes. And, and the devil is a master of taking just powerful melodies and then he puts it together, what would normally be good, powerful melodies, and he puts it together with wicked words. And then some people think you can take the wicked music and put good words on it and sometimes it, somehow it's going to baptize the bad music doesn't work that way. You remember the story in the Bible? King David was harassed by depression, evil spirits. And they heard about David was skillful on the harp. Probably wasn't an electric harp either. I want you to note that. 1 Samuel 16 verse 23, And it came to pass that when the evil spirit from God was on Saul, that David took a harp and he played with his hand. And I don't think he played Grateful Dead or Led Zeppelin or anything like that. He probably played soothing melodies. And the Bible says that uh, so Saul was refreshed. Just the music would be refreshing to him and the spirits would leave. Now, stay with me. If the right kind of music played by the servant of God can chase the evil spirits away, would it be safe to assume that there's the other kind of music played by the servants of the devil that can bring the evil spirits in? And let me suggest to you that a lot of that has found its way into God's church and we think that music is a neutral medium and it's not. I grew up in the world. My mother was a songwriter. Some of the great composers, Tony winners, were in our home. They were friends, creative, powerful musicians. And uh, I understand something about music. And I was shocked coming from the world into the church. Right about the time I was coming into the church, I started noticing all of these, what I would call worldly styles and standards and samples of music were starting to come into the church, and it, it surprised me. And now it's becoming the norm. I don't have time to do a whole seminar on that. But while I'm on the subject of music, 1 John chapter 2, verse 6, talk about dancing. And he said... He that saith he abide in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. I get questions every now and then from young people when I go to the colleges. They say, Pastor Doug, but what's wrong with dancing? King David danced. I say, yeah, King David danced before the ark in a, a linen cloth, in a robe. He said, if you're going to do that, I have no problem with that. 
you don't have men and women dancing together in the Bible. The seductive kind of dance that Salome danced for Herod, after she danced like that, John the Baptist lost his head. That's the wrong kind of dancing. Most of the dancing in the world today that the young people are wanting to engage in is the worldly kind of dancing, and it is very suggestive, very sexual. And the bottom line is, what would Jesus do? Be honest. Can you really picture Jesus down at whatever the local dance joint is doing the... I won't even attempt to illustrate because I have no rhythm. So this is no temptation for me. But uh, the Bible says, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, But he who is called you is holy, so be holy in all of your conduct. Number nine, what clear guidelines does Jesus give us for watching television? Answer? Now, first of all, you don't have to have a TV. I will set, Psalm 101, verse 3, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. We shouldn't even be looking at something wicked. Isaiah 33, 15, He who walks righteously, and actually I think this is Psalms, oh no, this is Isaiah 33, 15, He who walks righteously, who stops his ears from hearing of bloodshed, and he shuts his eyes from seeing evil. And our culture is as permeated with the influence of television. It used to be people had three channels. When I grew up, it was ABC, CBS, NBC. You know, any of you remember that? And you might only get one of those three. And that was only if you moved the coat hanger, right? <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about. Now people get these kids, their dishes and things, and they get hundreds of stations. And they just sit there until they, they find one. And in the process of surfing for something that is ostensibly good, they got to look at a lot of filth. By the age of 18, the average American, one study said, American child will have seen 200,000 violent acts on television, including 40,000 murders, according to Thomas Radnecki, research director for the National Coalition of Television Violence. The average 2 to 11-year-old watches TV 25 hours a week, that's more time than they spend in school. So what has the greatest influence on them? And this is actually not, not the newest study. I think it's even more today. And one of the problems with childhood obesity, do you know what contributes to that? If they're not playing video games, they're watching TV, and they're just not getting out and running around like we did when we were kids. It's not only bad for their mental health, it's bad for their physical health. Romans chapter 1, verse 32. Now, uh, let me read this, and then I'll explain who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Let me explain what, what that means. You are probably thinking, some of you may be thinking, I'm a Christian. I know there's a lot of nasty things on TV, and occasionally I know I watch some things, but you know, I, I feel bad about it, but I would never do those things. I would never murder, I would never commit adultery, I would never steal or lie or curse. But if you're doing these things for entertainment and enjoying it vicarious, vicariously, what did that former reform say? Those that have pleasure in those that do them. Are we culpable for supporting the industry by enjoying it? I'd never liked it, but I'm entertained by it. So we, we sin by proxy by watching everybody else do it. Job 31 verse 1. I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? Especially once you, of course, you know that when it comes to uh, thinking those thoughts. But he said, I've made a covenant with my eyes. I'd like to invite you to make a covenant with your eyes during this series, not to behold that which is evil or set any wicked thing before your eyes. You wonder why it's hard to be pure for a Christian in this day and age? I'll tell you, TV is a powerful medium. TV in of, of itself is not a bad thing. It is simply a tool for communicating audio visual information. These messages are going via television signal around the world right now. I'm hoping people hear the truth. But let's face it, most of what's on TV is not the gospel right now. And I'll tell you, if you can't control it, get rid of your TV, even if it means you can't see this program anymore. What profit is it if you have all 99 stations and you lose your soul? Number 10. And I'll go one more step further. Some people are addicted to the Internet, and the Internet has a lot of really neat things, a lot of 
uh, stuff that you can do to research. But if you're having problems with it, unplug it. Right? Just to cancel it. Number 10. What solemn warning does Jesus give us about the example and influence in our lives? Matthew 18, verse 6. But whoso shall offend one of the least of these which believes in me, it'd be better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. So we're not only wanting to live holy, godly, pure lives because there's power in purity, but we're wanting to do it because we are an example for others. Romans 14, verse 13. Let no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Not only do our children watch us, and typically the best way to teach children is example, example, and then example. But others watch us. And some things that you might be able to handle, by your example other people can handle it, let it go. Paul says, I'm not going to do anything that's going to make my brother stumble. Romans 14, verse 7. None of us lives unto himself. We're not islands. Christianity is about loving each other. And so we want to be godly examples, not only for the witness for God, but for those who are around us. Number 11. What are Jesus' principles of conduct regarding clothing and jewelry? <laughs> oh, I'm looking at my clock. Let me read this next verse for you. I just like to always introduce this subject with this verse. Galatians 4.16 Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? <laughs> I, I want to tell you the truth. Amen. Does it matter what we wear? Yes. The Bible talks about uh, the godly apparel of his people, his priests, very simple apparel. Everything had a meaning and a purpose. In Revelation there are two churches. One is the counterfeit, worldly church, and the other is the pure. The way we know who they are is by what they wear. Neither of them ever utters a single word to say who they are. One is clothed with light. That's God's church. It makes a difference what we wear. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. The Bible is telling us that Christians should be modest. I believe Christians should be clean in what they wear. Oh, my tie's crooked. This is a really useless piece of clothing, I'll tell you that right now. I've, I mean, we've already got enough troubles in life without a man having to wake up and put a noose around his neck, right? Start his day. But... <clears throat> It's considered respectful. So, in First Peter chapter three, verse three, who, oh wait, I started telling you something. Christians are supposed to be neat in their appearance. I became very self-conscious when I said that. Looked down, saw my tie was crooked. We ought to be modest. Christians should not be flamboyant and ostentatious, trying to get people to look at us because a Christ is humble. It's the spirit of the devil that is proud, and you're never more like the devil than when you're proud and say, "Look at me! Look at me!" And yet, you're constantly being bombarded with messages to attract attention to self. 1 Peter 3, verse 3. Who's adorning? Let it not be the outward adorning. The plating of the hair, the wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. It needs to be that inward adorning and not the outward adorning. This is what the Lord really wants. The temple had a lot of gold. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? We're the church. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You read about that temple and the gold's on the inside. The outside was marble. It's the inner gold that God's interested in. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? And today, you know, every time I get to this message, and I do this every time, it's getting where I have more and more I need to say about it, because in the world it's not getting better, it's getting worse. I mean, you just look at all of the body piercing. Do you mind if I talk about that for a second? It just has gone hog wild. 
Now, this is something that is it's a pagan practice that you can find in the pagan religions all around the world. I'm going to quickly go through some examples because I've traveled all over the world and I've seen it. For instance, in India, the Hindus, they pierce themselves as a way to uh, appease the gods and to make a statement for the gods and as good luck for the gods and it's very pagan in its trappings. Nepal, uh, you've got this here. In Africa, you've got another example uh, of the body piercing and mutilating of the body in order to accommodate the, the gold and the jewels and the Burma. That can't be good for you. And then of course California, body piercing there as well. Oh, that's the wrong slide. It's the next slide. That's California. Yeah, and you're thinking, well, Pastor Doug, I'd never do that. Well, how much is too much? If we're all children of God, I wonder what angels see when they look down at earth and they see humans mutilating their bodies and hanging minerals on their bodies. We're supposed to be born again when we're Christians. We're the children of God. Now, does that bother you? Don't worry, friends, that is special effects. Some of you mothers, your heart, oh no, who did they do? You're going to call Child Protective Services. <laughs> that was just, a, they did that in Photoshop. But didn't that bother you? Why would you want to see a baby like that? Well, God doesn't want to see his babies like that either. Let me tell you right now. When the Lord made you, he made you with the appropriate number of holes. He doesn't want you to add to that. It is typical of devil worship in the Bible the prophets of Baal, they leapt on the altar and they cut themselves. And I understand a lot of youth these days and people are, they, there's self-mutilation. It's more common among girls, but even boys, where they just get this, this problem. It's almost like an obsession to cut themselves and mutilate themselves. When this man was demon-possessed in Mark chapter 5, he took stones and he cut his flesh. This is not how you worship God, by mutilating your body. Oh, in case you're wondering, the devil does believe in body piercing. He practiced it on Jesus. Your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God is interested in the inward adorning, not the outward adorning, friends. Amen? Our bodies should be simple and pure and holy. These are the temples of God. And again, you read Isaiah chapter 3, all the, the jewelry becoming so prevalent in the church today. Verse 18, In that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments. He's talking about the proud daughters of Zion in his church. They began to do this, and God said a plague, a curse was coming upon them. The chains and the bracelets and the mufflers and the bonnets and the ornaments and the leg jewels and the headbands and the tabrets. And notice the earrings, the rings, and the nose jewels. Again, uh, Luke chapter 16, verse 15. Jesus said, you are those who justify yourselves before me, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Just because something is highly esteemed in the world, and it seems to be widely accepted in the church, does not mean that God has accepted it. God is calling upon His bride and those who are part of His bride to be pure. Babylon, the fallen church, is called the mother of what? And one of the typical things in a harlot's attire is they're, typical, they're usually advertised by what they wear, don't they? Pastor Doug, you, does the Bible really say that jewelry is inappropriate? During the Exodus experience, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt and they just made the covenant with the Lord, the Lord's about to bring them into the promised land. What did they do? They made a golden calf and they worshipped it. They talked Aaron into passing the plate and they took their earrings out of the rings, uh, out of the not only their daughters, their sons. When I grew up, there were no sons wearing the rings and the earrings and the nose jewels, but there are now. These are things they brought from the Egyptians. It was money they took from the Egyptians they were supposed to use for building the temple, but instead of putting it into the temple, they had it on themselves. They made a golden calf. Just a little calf, because that's all you, they could get, enough to make a calf. My concern is that if you pass the plate in churches today and collected the jewelry and melted it down, I think you can make a whole buffalo. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I think we ought to take that stuff off. It's all going to melt when Jesus comes. You don't want to be wearing that. 
Luke 35, verse 3 and 4. No, I'm sorry, Genesis 35, verse 3 and 4. When Jacob was preparing to come before the Lord, he said, Let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I'll make there an altar unto God. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods that were in their hands. Notice, strange gods, pagan gods from the local nations, and the earrings that were in their ears. Don't miss that connection of the paganism and the jewelry. And Man, we got a whole channel, probably several channels in North America dedicated. I can't imagine how anybody would sit there and watch the jewelry channel. And they say the same thing about all of it. And I'm just, uh, Pastor Doug, are you telling me that everybody that wears jewelry is lost? No. There can be millions of people in heaven that wore varying amounts of jewelry. But in the last generation, God's calling us to a higher standard, not a lower one. We are living in the, in the age of judgment. We're trying to call the world out of its decadence. How can we be a, wet, a witness to the world of holiness when we compromise? And if we compromise a little bit, we create a stumbling block. And I might say, oh, well, you know, I, I don't wear a lot of jewelry, just one earring. <clears throat> what would it do to you if I was up here with one little bitty diamond stud? Would it affect you? Why? So you want me to live a higher standard, right? Because after all, I'm a preacher. Well, you're a nation of priests. Amen. You should have a high standard, too. And if I would wear my one little, don't worry, I'm not doing it. I'm afraid, afraid of blood. I'm not going to pierce my ears. If I were to do that, I might say, well, that's, I can control it. I don't get carried away. But someone else would look at me and say, Pastor Doug wears jewelry. And then they wear enough to pick up radio frequencies. Right? <laughs> that's true. That's how it works. Some people are insecure, you know, and, and they don't feel like they're worth enough and they think they can raise their perceived value by hanging a lot of valuables on them. A lot of people feel that way. Some people struggle with shopping because it, it really is an issue of self-worth, I think. And while I'm on the subject, if you have any doubts, tattoos, oh, my heart breaks and goes out to these young people that just getting all these tattoos, they don't know how hard they are to get rid of, how painful it is to get rid of, how expensive it is to get rid of. And I've never known anybody that gets a tattoo that 10 years later is proud of it. They, they almost always say, hey, and I, yeah, sometimes they'll tattoo a girlfriend and then they uh, fall out and they got their name there forever. And people, when they get old with tattoos, it always looks like a wrinkled ancient map or something. You can never even see what it says. It's not going to get better. Leviticus 19.28, pretty clear. You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor shall you make any tattoo marks on you. Is that clear? Say amen. amen. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You don't put graffiti on the temple of God. Oh, but I'm going to get a tattoo of a cross. Someone said, I'm going to tattoo Jesus' face. Uh, Jesus doesn't want you to do it like that. If you, want to, if you want to honor Christ, bear the cross. Don't tattoo it on yourself. Don't wear it. Reflect Him in your life, not on your shoulder. That's the easy way out. You want to advertise for Jesus, do it with your behavior. Amen. Number 12. How do conduct and obedience relate to salvation? John 3, verse 22. We keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Because we love Him. And again, remember, Jesus said it's not everyone that says, Lord, Lord. Well, I'm running out of time again. Let me, let me go to my slides real quick. Uh, just go ahead and, and uh, go through those real fast here. I'll get down towards the end. I want to bring John out for a second. John, come on out. We're going to have our, our prayer in just a moment. You know, before uh, the gladiator scenes ceased in the Roman Colosseum, there was a monk who had come one day, and at the urging of others, he came to the Colosseum, and he was horrified to see the carnage and the bloodshed there. His name was Telemachus. And he saw it, and it was supposed to be, there was supposed to be a bunch of Christians there that were watching it. And the gladiators were fighting, and the blood was everywhere. That's where you get the word carnival. And he couldn't stand it anymore, and he jumped down into the arena, and he ran into the midst, and he turned, and he said to everybody, this is not right, this must stop, God is not pleased. And the emperor ordered him to be thrust through, and the Christian friar was killed. But nobody could forget his courage, and everybody in history says that's about when the gladiator games ended. Somebody finally stood up and said, this is just not right. That it needs to cease. There is so much worldliness that has come into the church. And the only way it's going to change is if individuals like you and like me say, enough is enough. 
We've got to start taking it seriously and be like Jesus. There is power in purity. You want to see the gospel go around the world? Let Christians start living like Christ and it'll spread like fire. I want you to pray about what you can do to make a change, as John sings. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. I am thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make. John, and thank you, Carol, also. Has anything convicted you tonight? You sense perhaps a need for a higher standard of purity? There was one of the knights of King Arthur's round table. He was called um, Galahad. And he said, I have the strength of ten men because my heart is pure. And so he was fearless in battle. I think the strength and the power of the church has been largely neutralized because we're missing the holiness that we need. Would you like to pray that Jesus would help you to do the impossible in this world, walk on water, and keep your eyes on Christ and live a holy life, to be a new creature? Is that your desire? Father in heaven, Lord, this is a big subject. We've just touched on it a little bit. I feel convicted even as I speak that I would like to be more like Jesus. Help us to keep our eyes fixed on him that we might be transformed by beholding. Bless these people, bless this church, Lord, that we might make tangible changes to represent Jesus, that the world might see and be one. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, friends. Don't forget, Sabbath morning we're going to be meeting. Miraculous medicine is our subject. We hope to see you then.